come to us, stand alone in the breach, and face the worst that the tyrant's might and enmity can do. Bearing ourselves humbly before God, but conscious that we serve an unfolding purpose, we are ready to defend our native land against the invasion by which it is threatened. In June 1940, Hitler knew he had to gain command of the skies over Britain before he could invade. This meant destroying the fighter stations that protected London. Throughout the summer, workers in gardens like Chiltern carried on with a deadly battle raging in the skies above them. The airfields were almost destroyed when Hitler's bombers unexpectedly turned their attention to London. It gave a vital breathing space. Fighter Command's victory on September the 15th finally persuaded Hitler to call off the invasion. During these anxious weeks, people on the ground were keen to help in any way they could. Oh, Joyce, go and see if that is at the door, will you please? Ruth Mott, in her kitchen, receives a visit from volunteers collecting aluminium pots and pans to turn into planes. This was the brainchild of newspaper tycoon Lord Beaverbrook, Minister of Aircraft Production. Everybody, including the royal family, loyally handed over their saucepans. Oh, this old one with a string handle can go. Get rid of that. That one isn't much good either. They can take that one. And I think this aluminium jug, uh, that'll do for today. If I find anything else, we'll let them know. All right. All right, then. Everybody rustled around and tried to find something because you felt that you were helping the war effort, you know? You sort of felt that it wasn't going to uh, terminate unless you'd done something to help it. The appeal yielded a 1,000 tonnes of metal. How much actually went into building planes is uncertain, as much of the aluminium was of low grade. For the housewife, it meant yet another shortage. Few saw aluminium saucepans again until after the war. Faced with heavy losses at sea, the Minister of Agriculture renewed his efforts to get people to grow their own food. Today we begin a new Dig for Victory campaign. Mayors from all parts of the country took part. We carried it through during an air raid, one of the many London has been having today. But we were all agreed that a successful Dig for Victory campaign this autumn was one of the best answers to Hitler's attempt to damage our overseas food supplies and interrupt our communications. Originally called Grow More Food, the campaign now became known as Dig for Victory. Its famous logo immortalised the spade work of London gardener W.H. Mackay. In peacetime, the continent sends us over a quarter of a million tonnes of vegetables a year. Hitler has cut them off for the moment. We must now grow them ourselves. Alongside the Dig for Victory movement, the men from the Ministry of Food pursued their campaign with equal relish. Their boss, Lord Walton, was another frequent broadcaster. As you have just heard, uh, it is to you 
the housewives of Britain that I want to talk tonight. And I'm going to be very practical <laughs> and a bit personal too. First, you mustn't waste any food. We want all the ships that we can get to carry munitions. And I tell you in plain and direct language that you are risking the lives of our fighting men if you, your waste of food, takes up extra shipping space. Now don't tell me that you never waste a thing. Lord Walton had been brought into the government because of his considerable experience in running a chain of department stores. His friendly manner and homely turn of phrase established him in the minds, if not always the hearts, of his listeners. Sugar? Now, now really, I've heard a lot about sugar. Really, can't you cut it down in wartime? I have done. I'm well below the ration. And tea takes up a lot of space. Now, here's a new slogan for the kitchen front. One for each person and none for the pot in wartime. Let's have the ships instead. Under pressure from Lord Walton, the BBC started The Kitchen Front, a series of daily broadcasts about cooking. The recipes proved popular and were eventually published as a book. Right, I'm off to the village now. All right, we'll take the ration book then. Anything you want in particular? Uh, yes, we must have the butter today. Oh, nice. Ruth has chosen the wartime chocolate pudding. The recipe uses syrup and cocoa, both still unrationed. It also includes carrot, often used to save on sugar. If you see anything else you think we ought to have that's not on the ration, bring it along. Right, see you later then. Yeah. Bye. Bye. I'm just grating this up to finish it up, and I think I will have got about two teacupfuls here by then, and that should be enough to go in our pudding for today. Um, carrot basically was used a lot in the wartime as a sweetening agent, so we've cut down the sugar to one ounce, and so we're going to put in two ounces of margarine. and the one ounce of sugar which we've got ready. And we're going to just beat that up until it all mixes in nicely together. It'll take a minute because we've got it nice and soft. And into that we're going to put our two cups of grated carrot. Um, a teacup we're using so if anyone wants to make it now, that's equivalent to four ounces, one teacup. And we have no egg in this pudding either, so we've got to use extra raisin agent for it. We wind this all up together. So we're allowed to take it off the back of their hands with their fingers. Into that we're now going to put the four teacups of flour. We'll just add it by degrees, about a cup at a time, and then it works, it'll be easier to work in. followed by a good heap tablespoonful of cocoa. A little bit for luck. A teaspoonful of uh, bicarb, which We'll give it a raisin agent and some baking powder. So this will help make it puff up in the basin. It should make a very light pudding, actually. I think it will. Now have a cup of 
couple of tablespoonfuls of treacle. We'll be fairly generous with it because it's not on the ration, but I expect it will be eventually. And I should now change spoons because it'll work in better with this one that's got a cut in action. And half a pint of milk. It may not take all the half pint, so we'll see how it goes. I shall only add a drop of milk at a time because all flowers don't absorb the same amount of moisture so that we might be able to save a little drop of that milk for tomorrow. I want to have a cup of tea. I would consider was about right. And then we just put it into the basin. And when that's cooked, you won't find any of that carrot. It steams for about two hours. That should take it and make it very nice. the margarine paper that we've saved carefully over the top and then we'll tuck it down round and then we'll steam it with that. That steams for about two hours. Chocolate puddings were a luxury that could be ill afforded later in the war. By 1942 syrup and cocoa were both rationed. Now, homegrown vegetables were going to be the mainstay of a family's diet. But digging up the back garden would barely produce enough. Local authorities were encouraged to provide allotments. The hunt for land produced some strange settings for a cabbage patch, including the moat of the Tower of London. We've got over a million allotments now. I want another half million by next spring. Now, some of you may think that growing vegetables is too difficult. It really isn't. Every council office will help you. There are lots of knowledgeable people about to lend you a hand. The old skilled allotment holders, county horticultural superintendents, park superintendents, gardeners, private and public. Hello, Mr Dodson. Hey, let's have a look at this problem you've got. Well, you can My see... word, he is active, isn't he? Well... We've got to find the run-in. It's no good thinking we can set a trap there. He's got to run somewhere which it uses. Do you want a stick or a rod? The back garden of the house where Anne is billeted has been invaded by a mole. With no knowledge of how to deal with the hidden enemy, she's asked her employer Harry Dodson to help her. Yes, that's it. Now we can start work. He's very deep. Very deep. Got to find the old ape with your fingers in case you've muffled it. He's got a clear hole now right through. Now that should be all right. It's quite simple to set the trap, look. All right? Yeah. Place the trap down in, and you want the tongue nearly down on to the, to the bottom of the run, because it's that tongue that he's going to knock out of position which will trap him. 
Now, these leaves are to hold the soil clear. There must be a clear run through the bottom because they always have a clear run in and you must keep that with the trap in there clear. And the most important thing of all is to fill the hole in at the top because there must be no daylight show through. If there's daylight showing through, he won't have it. He'll dodge back. It needs very often a very gentle hand to, to put that on there and very light soil, but I think you'll find that will be all right. Now, when you come tomorrow morning, if that trap is eight wide, these two pieces are eight wide, eight to about here. Mm -hmm. If you pull the trap out with any luck at all, your little friend should be on the bottom. Oh, I look forward to it. If not, I'll have to come back and uh, try and find another run in. Okay. That will be the best course of action. Before the war, much of the country's stocks of seed came from abroad. When the bulk of these supplies were cut off, gardeners were encouraged to save their own. Unfortunately, they had to be selective. Cabbage and cauliflower produced inferior seedlings, but others, like leek, gave reliable seed. It would be late August, early September, before the seed pod would actually begin to crack open. The cost of seed soared. By the end of the war, it had reached four times its pre-war level. Despite the efforts of the amateur gardener, most seeds still came from the large companies who had been forced to expand home production. Quite a number of the seed, you hung them up somewhere dry and the uh, capsule popped and the seed fell out. It was a bit fussy, there was, uh, but uh, when things was hard to come by and that sort of thing, if you had a good stock of leek and onion, it was worth doing. Tomorrow we will be Mr and Mrs. I needn't wander home. 1940 saw an unprecedented boom in weddings. Dunkirk had brought the country's young men back home, and in spite of an uncertain future ahead of them, many couples felt it the right moment to get married. So good night, darling. Two words so hard to say. The cake was still the centerpiece of the wedding. But traditional ingredients were hard to come by. One marzipan substitute was made from soya flour and almond essence mixed with water and margarine. And just give that a good beat up. Now that's getting nice and ready to cool down. It's too soft to handle to put onto the top of the cake at the moment. Uh, to put it onto a fruit cake for Christmas or a wedding, uh, you'd only do it about a week beforehand and then put it onto the cake. It goes on drying out, so that if you did it longer than that, you'd have a very hard top to your cake. A family was entitled to an extra food allowance for each guest invited, but the amounts were small, and so was the cake. Didn't ever get beyond a 10 inch, and that was quite a big one. The most popular size was about an 8 inch cake tin, which you know did, and you only cut out little slithers, it wasn't a slice, so it was only about a little portion of about an inch by an inch. 
So good night, darling. Our dream boat is in sight, ringing wedding bells. But the heaviest blow came with the sugar order of August 1940. This forbade the placing of sugar on any cake after baking. There'll be no need to write. So good night, darling, good night. The confectioner's art was replaced by a concoction of cardboard and plaster. Well, I had a cover like this for my wedding cake. Uh, my grocer ordered it for me in the village, but I had no idea that it was going to be a cardboard cover when it came, so that was a great surprise. Uh, I kept it for many years because I also used it when I made wedding cakes, and it had a, a little sort of arrangement on the top that tied on with ribbon, so I was able to undo the ribbons, take the top off, um, put a stalk over the top or a bow of pink ribbon if it was a um, 21st birthday cake or something like that. So it was a very versatile piece of equipment, this. When we look back now to years gone by To a dark and stormy sky How we survived, come rain or shine, it turned out fine. Though the memories are fading of those days so long ago now, when skies were turning. the sun 